Good morning. This is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. <clears throat> this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This is October 23rd, 2000, and this morning we are pleased to have with us Harold Siegel. Harold, how are you today? Pretty good. Pretty good. May I ask how old you are, please? Yes, sir. I'm 82. 82 years old. And what is your current address? Framingham, Mass. And current marital status? Married. Married? Very, very much married. <laughs> Do you have children, Harold? Yes, sir. Two. And grandchildren? One. Where were you born, Harold? Roxbury, Massachusetts. And were you raised there? Yes. Um, we'll get to later on asking you when, how you got to Natick, but tell us about going to school in Roxbury. I'm very happy and I think lucky that I went to the Boston school system at that time. Um, the teaching was great. Um, I enjoyed school and uh, I went to the Phillips Brooks, I went to, well, I went to the Hull School uh, Elementary School with kindergarten on Quincy Street. Uh, I was born on Faston Street. Quincy Street is the next street to Faston. Then uh, from the uh, fifth grade on, I went to the Phillips, Phillips Brooks School on Perth Street, off of, off of Faston Street in Roxbury. And then from the eighth grade on, I went to Rocks Memorial High School from 1931 to 1935. During that period, I did move from, uh, from Faston Street in Roxbury up towards Grove Hall in 1927. And then uh, we moved to Washington Street which is kind of on the border of Roxbury and Dorchester, mm -hmm. which was ri right near <clears throat> Columbia Road. For purposes of uh, people who are watching this tape 100 years from now, Roxbury is a part of the city of Boston. Yes, sir. So that you were born and uh, grew up about 20 miles east of where we are today. Just about. Okay. Right. So in 1935, um, you finished high school? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Um, what, was, what was your family life like? What, what did your dad do? My father was a machinist, and uh, he was a good machinist, and uh, he uh, did a lot of machine work during World War I. And then after World War I, when there's very little demand for defense products, machine shops, uh, let go of a lot of people. And when the Depression took place in 1931, we were hit as hard as anybody else. So that um, my father, if he was lucky, got one day a week uh, work in a machine shop, and some weeks none at all. And he would take whatever kind of a job he could. And I'm one of four sons, and all of us worked as we could right after school and helped. And, what, uh, what about your mother, Harold? What did she do? My mother just worked, uh, at, she was, I guess what they call today, a domestic engineer. She took care of she four, was four an old-fashioned mother who yeah. got up early in the morning <clears throat> and would help my father if she'd get up at 5 o'clock and make his breakfast and make his lunch and make our lunches when he went off to school and did all the laundry and everything else that, that a mother did in those days. And uh, uh, it was, we had a good family life and we were close. You just spoke of, of, of getting a very good education um, at, at Roxbury High, a very uh, well-known school. Did you go on to school after that? Well, uh, my major, uh, because of the depression when we went to high school, and I went to high school in 1931 through 1935, um, none of us felt that we could go to college, or could afford to go to college. So. I majored in a commercial course. We're offered three courses, college courses, commercial courses, or technical courses. I took a, com a commercial course in where I could learn bookkeeping and typing and shorthand and office work and things like that. And uh, when I graduated high school in my senior year, we took what we call accounting in the fourth year. And I did pretty good at that. And my uh, teacher thought I was 
pretty good at and recommended me to Bentley School of Accounting and Finance at night. And uh, Bentley's accepted me uh, in, uh, for my second year. They let me go bypass the first year. So I went to Bentley's at night uh, from 1935 to 1936. And uh, the tuition... Uh, at that time, with kind of a scholarship they gave me, it was only about 50 or $60 a semester. But uh, at the end of the year, I didn't like it because I was only 17 at the time. I was, I graduated at 16, uh, just a few weeks shy of my 17th birthday. And uh, I really wasn't mature enough for night school. Bentley's in those days was really for bookkeepers and accountants, and I was just a kid. and. While I passed everything, I just didn't like it. It wasn't for you. No. Yeah. Then the following year, I just didn't do anything it's, as far as school went, and I worked, uh, took different jobs around wherever I could to help the family. And um, I went back to school in 1937. I went to Boston University at night, and uh, it only cost me $90 a semester. And in those days, if I made $15 a week and coffee was only five cents or 10 cents at the most, and my mother made lunches, I could swing it. So I went to BU at night, starting in 1937, and I went for a degree, and, and to get a degree at BU at night, you had to go six years. Six years at night would be the equivalent of four years during the day. And uh, we would go three or four nights a week, depending upon the credits we needed to get, get by in that year. What were you majoring at? Then? Accounting. <clears throat> I won an accounting scholarship, uh, a competitive accounting scholarship uh, that year, as a matter of fact, and uh, I won uh, $25. That was my, which was 25, well, 28 percent of my year's tuition. <laughs> you, sir, you're going to be you at night, yes, and starting in 1937. Um, 1939 comes along and a war breaks out in Europe. Um, did you feel that the United States was going to become involved in that? And did you think about your in, in school and what you might do about that? Well, I took a course called Current Events at Night at BU and we discussed the war. We discussed the different isms like uh, <clears throat> Nazism and fascism and communism. Uh, as opposed to democracy, and uh, everything was happening at once, and it was very difficult. It's very confusing period because communism uh, was quite prevalent, of course, in Russia, and they exported it around the world, and uh, Hitler's fascism, along with Mussolini's fascism, uh, created uh, another very serious problem in the world, world of course, in the United States. And uh, there was great empathy and sympathy uh, towards the European nations that were being stepped on by Hitler. And uh, we all knew what was going on through the newspapers and radio. But it didn't occur to me that we'd be going to war in the next couple of years. Where were you on December 7th, 1941? I remember it clearly. I was I was in the Sunday, I think it was Sunday afternoon that I heard it. I was in what we call the parlor in those days. That was, today they call it the living room and some may call it the family <coughs> room, but I was in the parlor and I was doing my homework on a bridge table and I heard, uh, I think it was John Charles Daly or something like that, who broke in to whatever is being broadcast and saying, something about we interrupt this program to bring you a special bulletin that Pearl Harbor was attacked and bombed. And I had absolutely no idea where Pearl Harbor was, except that it appeared that Pearl Harbor was one of our possessions and something to be concerned about. You were with your family yes, sir. Uh, when you heard this. I was at home. Um, I happen to know that you went the next day to try and join the Army. Yes. Um, but that afternoon, what discussion was there in your household about this? Well, there was tremendous anxiety. Um, 
I was then 23. Uh, my brother, my, old, uh, my older brother was about 28, and he was married two years. And I think he had a son born that January of, of 41. Then I had a younger brother who was about 18. 1941. Yeah, he's about 18. And then a further younger brother who was about uh, 12. And um, so three of you I had already received, could think about being yes, seriously affected yes. by this. I had already received my uh, draft card, and uh, I was uh, listed as 1A. And so the next day I went down to 209 Columbus Avenue. I remember the building and the, and the address and uh, to enlist because we were all advised that if you went down to enlist, you could choose your branch of service. So I chose the Signal Corps. And, uh, but uh, before I went to 209 Columbus Avenue, I went to the uh, Air Force to enlist. And uh, I wore glasses then, as I do today, and my eyes uh, weren't particularly strong. Um, uh, my left eye was 2400s, my right eye is 2600s, and I walked into the Air Force uh, recruiting office. Uh, it was crowded, a lot of people were in there, and when, when my turn came, they just automatically said no, because the fact I was wearing glasses indicated that uh, I had something, my eyesight was not particularly pure. And they had all the good uh, physical specimens they needed. So. From there, I went to the Marines, and the same thing happened. They rejected me out of hand without even giving me a physical. Because you were wearing wore glasses. glasses. Yeah, and um, as I say, um, they had the cream. Uh, the guys who were in excellent condition, they had the choice. Uh, everybody, the patriotism fervor was so immense that uh, when I went to these different places, it was crowded. Everybody was enlisting. And I went to the Navy, and they rejected me. So I said, well, the Army, Army will take me. They'll take anybody. And they rejected me. I went through the, uh, the physical with the Army. I passed everything till, till it came time to check my eyes. And they rejected me because of my eyes. And so I could, I could see how crowded they were and how much chaos and confusion there was. I went back the next day. And there were different doctors, and uh, everything was different and new. And, but you still had a tremendous crowd of young men who wanted to enlist, and I just got in line, went through the physical again, passed everything, and I'm standing there in my underwear and holding on to my clothes, and came to the I came to the eye chart, and took off my before I took off my glasses, I just looked at the chart and memorized as much as I could. And they said, "Take off your glasses," and I did. And they said, "Read what you can," and I whatever I memorized, I said, and they passed me. And uh, that's how I got in. I think a couple of years ago, uh, Merrill Lynch did a commercial on the same thing. And it was quite interesting, but that's how I got in. And I told them at that time I was going to be you at night, and could I be allowed to, uh, could I be deferred uh, until I took my finals for the first, it was the, then the first semester of my fifth year. And uh, they, they allowed me to take my exams and uh, after I took my exams, I went back and they sent me to Camp Devons. <clears throat> okay, uh, just step back a second here. Uh, did any any other of your friends enlist when you did? Oh, yes. So you, you were not going into the Army all alone? No. Okay. no, but I went alone myself in those days, those two days, by myself. I, I uh, was fortunate. I had a lot of wonderful boyfriends. Uh, we had a... Uh, we played athletics a great deal. Baseball was important to us, and football. And uh, so I had a, I was a member of a great group of guys, and a number of them went down to enlist uh, when it was convenient for them, you know, like like anything else. Wasn't part them. of your strength uh, when you got into the army? Didn't you at school uh, p take part in military? Oh yes, uh, precision yes. and things like at, that. Uh, the high school I went to, Roxmurrell High School, uh, they taught us military drill, and um, uh, it, 
based upon World War I, they, they felt that we weren't really prepared when we went into action at World War I, so they wanted to make sure that we were a little bit more knowledgeable and familiar with certain things than those who went in World War I. So uh, we had a period every week at Rocks Memorial High School where we learned military drill and manual of arms and marching or marching um, uh, maneuvers. Well, every Boston high school did the same thing as the high school I went to. In those days, they, they separated the boys and the girls. They had boy, boys' high schools and girls' high schools. <clears throat> and at the end of each year, we'd have a schoolboy parade where we'd start at Copley Square and march up in, in full uniform. Uh, the officers, the young men in, in, in our class, that for those who were officers, wore puttees, uh, uniform, Sam Brown belt, and uh, the enlisted men wore leggings, no, no Sam Brown belt, and uh, so we have what they call it, it's a very famous schoolboy parade of the, of the young high school boys. And uh, they'd march up uh, from Copper Square, up Boylston Street, up Washington Street, up Tremont, past School Street, where uh, the mayor was, and we'd salute the mayor, and then we up, went up Park Street to Beacon Street and past uh, mm -hmm. the State House where the governor was, and we'd salute the governor and continue down Beacon Street where we'd break up. So you had some uh, experience before you entered the Oh, yes, my answer, I knew that, yeah. So um, you got a deferment from uh, the Army to finish uh, some part of your schooling. And you were called to active duty in, in January of '42. Well, is that I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not familiar. Was the latter part of December or the first part of January? But in that period, about '42. Is either January second yeah. or third or December twenty-eighth or that Okay, period. and you went to Fort Devens, Massachusetts. Is yes, that sir. correct? Yes. Uh, were any friends sent with you? No. You were all by yourself, yes. so far as that was yes. concerned. Yes, I was. And the first barracks I was at was at Devon's. I didn't know a soul there, and, <laughs> and nobody else knew each other. And everybody, they're from New Hampshire and Vermont and Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And uh, so you're meeting some out-of-staters. That's for yeah. Yes. What was it like at Fort Devon's? There, in the middle of the winter, and a war had just started. I, I don't want to say apprehension was the key word, but we all wondered. Uh, where we were going from there, uh, what was going to happen to us. We volunteered. I mean, uh, I, uh, I volunteered, but I had no idea where I was going from there, and I was like jetsam or flotsam. And in other words, I was just, I was going to be pulled wherever direction they wanted to pull me, and that was it, and I'd go wherever they sent me. Was Fort Devon's just pretty much basic training the manual of arms no, and precision? Or? No, that was strictly a reception area. Okay. Where uh, what they did during the three or four days we were there, we had to take an Army ground classification test, which today I guess would be called some kind of an IQ test. And it was a very comprehensive, thorough test. And based upon that, they had a pretty good idea of who the individual was, what he was best suited for, where he should go, and, <clears throat> and the contribution he could make to the Army. And um, about three or four days later, I guess it was, um, and they woke us up like one o'clock in the morning, had us get dressed, marched us out of the barracks to the railroad yards, put us on a train, and we went. We had no idea where we were going. Um, my mother, <laughs> I'll never forget, my mother came to Camp Devons that Sunday. Uh, I, we may have left, let's say, on a Friday or Saturday, and I liked chocolate cake, and she was just a great mother who could cook and bake, and she knew I loved chocolate cake. She baked the chocolate cake, and she came to Devon's to see me, and they looked around, and they kept her waiting, and my mother and father together, and uh, kept them waiting, and they couldn't find me, and suddenly they came in, and they said I was gone. And my mother said, what do you mean he's gone? Where is he? Well, we can't say. I baked him this chocolate cake and his favorite cake, and oh, she was so disappointed. So but, you're on a train yes. and don't know where you're going. No. We're on uh, the train about three days. Okay, and where did you wind up? Cheyenne, Wyoming. The uh, we went to a to a fort called Fort Warren E. Fort 
Francis E. Warren, Cheyenne, Wyoming. In the middle of January. Yes, it was. Cold. You're in Wyoming. Yes, it was a Boy, cold I, winter. That's terrible. Yeah, they had a. They said they had one of the roughest winters they ever had. But uh, at any event, you know, you're young. I was 23 at the time, as I said, and uh, it, we could take it. What did you do at uh, Fort Warren? Well, what was interesting was when we got there, they said, this is a quartermaster camp. And I said, well, there's been a mistake. I enlisted in the Signal Corps. So I saw, uh, I asked the first sergeant if I could see the company commander, and they said, what about? So I told him. He said, well, I'm sorry. He said, the first sergeant, I'll never forget him, his name was Thomas E. Casey, a terrific guy. And he was a real tough, rough, old army sergeant. And, uh, but as tough as he was, that's how fair he was. And he said, I'm sorry, he said, but he looked at my records. He says, your, your records show that uh, you'd be best suited for the quartermaster because your major was accounting. And he seemed to be pretty good at that. And, and the quartermaster has administration and supply, which is important for the army. And, and then they just took on another branch uh, dealing with the convoys and trucks. So uh, he said, but this, this is what, sorry, you can get what you want, but this is where we think you're best suited. But he was kind enough to explain yes, it he, to you. Yes, he was that's, terrific. That's good. And did you, did you have an inkling then what you were going to do in the Quartermaster Corps? No, I didn't. We, all we did was basic training where uh, we had marching in the manual of arms and, uh, and uh, yeah, overnight bivouacs and uh, gas mask, uh, gassing uh, exercises and, and gas mask protection and rifle range and uh, pistol range. and. And everything that's like that. I find it hard to believe you did this in Cheyenne, Wyoming, in the middle of the winter. You went out on rifle ranges and marched well, around. Well, bear in mind, we got there. Let's say, let's say it was January 10th. Uh, by the time we had orientation and uh, basic army stuff before we went the rifle range and the pistol range, we're in like the first part of February. So. Um, that's worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, regardless, uh, I've got pictures that show us wearing these very heavy overcoats and not carrying our rifles. We're issued Springfield 03 rifles. Mm -hmm. Well, the Springfield 03 rifles were bolt action, a right hand bolt action. I notice you're left handed. I'm left handed. So when you fired uh, at, the, um, at the rifle range, you had to reach over, <laughs> whereas a right handed could do it very easily. And, uh, well, in any, any event, uh, if we lost the war, they'd have blamed me because I'm left-handed. We never would have got that rifle, that bolt action back in time. But in any event, we, uh, I was taught how to fire the Springfield 03 rifle. Uh, that was a World War I rifle. This is 1942. And uh, then they taught us how to fire pistols, revolvers. And uh, then we went on maneuvers at night and uh, learned about azimuths and uh, about what azimuths uh, you compass oh, readings no. okay. compass readings and um, and different other things that you were taught but uh, in the process especially in the first few days when they taught us the manual of arms and marching i knew that because uh, i had learned that in high school uh, right shoulder arms left shoulder arms present arms and uh, at and parade rests and all that so I did it very easily, and uh, and also in marching, uh, uh, when you squads, well, we didn't use squads left. We had squads left in high school, but to the rear march, by the left flank, by the right flank, I knew all that. So that Sergeant Casey made me uh, a drill instructor, and uh, I became a drill instructor, and I learned, and I was able to teach the others, and I was helpful there. And uh, so Casey was... Uh, uh, very helpful to me during the basic training. And I did everything that they wanted. At any time uh, during this basic training, um, did the Army or, or the military machine prepare you for cultural differences you might face if, uh, if and when you went overseas? No. No, because our basic training was to learn everything we can basically about the United States Army 
and uh, other courses they would teach us like field sanitation and first aid <clears throat> and everything else associated with being a soldier and to prepare yourself and to keep you alive and to be able to make a contribution. Uh, but after basic training, it was generally uh, 13 weeks or, or four months of basic training, they would then send you out to permanent units around the country. All that was in uh, at Fort Warren, Wyoming was like a holding or a staging area for about yeah. a four month period, during which time they'll, treat, they'll teach us the fundamentals and then at the end of that period they'd send you out to uh, permanent posts around the country where you'd be assigned permanently to a, to a specific uh, battalion or company or yeah. regiment. Harold, at uh, age 23, were you one of the older men in your unit? No, no I wasn't. Uh, there, there were a number it's interesting about that outfit they sent me to because uh, apparently I had a, f a fairly high um, IQ quotient at the time because our company consisted of those who were majoring in business, all lawyers, and uh, it, it was, I had heard around the camp that it was a kind of a, a high IQ group, and um, I, 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 I'm lost. What, what is that last question? I was just asking you if you were one of the older men. Oh, well, at the age older men. No, the reason I brought that up is because a lot of them uh, were lawyers. A lot of them were accountants mm -hmm. and established. There, there were some. There were men in their thirties that were there. And I, I'd say, no, as a matter of fact, I'd say I was more, more of the younger element at 23. Uh, there were a great many who were older than I who had finished college. You're leaving Fort Warren to go to a more permanent place. Uh, where were you sent? Well, before I can answer that, uh, what happened was that when the basic training was over, sometime around April, uh, or the first part of May, there were about 260 men in my company and they were sent out, but the Sergeant Casey pulled about five or six of us out of that 260 and uh, recommended us to Officers Candidate School. And uh, I, I, had, I hadn't applied for it. I wasn't even familiar with Officers Candidate School or what it, what it was all about. But uh, I was out of maneuvers and a Jeep came out and picked me up where we were out in the woods someplace and said, Sergeant Casey wants to see you. And I said, what about? And I said, well, bring you in. So I came in and he said he was sending me to Officers Candidate School. And then he had me meet the commanding officer who, who said he was authorizing it based upon Sergeant Casey's recommendation. So when they all were sent out to different units around the country, uh, myself and about five others were kept behind on what they call special duty, and uh, we, but for about two months, and then we went to Officers Candidate School right there at Fort Francis Warren in Wyoming, and starting in July. And uh, we had our choice of two courses, uh, one in uh, administration and supply, which would have kept me in the States a whole lot longer, might have ended at the Pentagon or other areas, but. The other one was uh, we had, uh, the quartermaster had taken over transportation and they were going to become the uh, truck battalions or convoys to bring the material and fuel and troops and uh, that stuff up forward. And I chose the, that, the latter. So I was sent to Officers Candidate School where we learned about the new GMC two and a half ton trucks that were coming into the Army and they were great trucks and they uh, strong and uh, great pulling power and uh, I learned how to tear apart a two and a half ton GMC truck at the Officers Candidate School and work with transmissions and uh, clutches and engines and uh, everything that goes along with it and uh, so in, s in September of 1942 I graduated as a brand new second lieutenant and uh, then they gave me my orders right away. They had, when we graduated, they had the regular graduation exercise like West Point. They had generals up there and they had marching all around and uh, 
were all given some kind of a diploma and making us brand new second lieutenants. We had ordered our uniforms a few days in advance and we all went back in our barracks, put it on, came downstairs and got our first salutes. What did your mother with the chocolate cake think of this, that you went into the Army as a private uh, six, seven, eight, now nine months ago, and now you're a second lieutenant. Wasn't well, she kind of pleased? They were thrilled. They were thrilled. Yeah. Uh, I was always somewhat of a uh, maverick son. I was always doing things, and uh, they—I <laughs> don't say they expected it. They were thrilled with it. As a matter of fact, my father was working at a machine shop, and the machine shop was working overtime, and. Uh, one of my younger brothers was working with him at the machine shop, and he was about 18, and he was anxious to go in. My father was mad at him because he wanted to go in the service, because I was in the service. And uh, my father said, Chief, I said, you work in a defense plant. They need you here just as much as the Army does, and you have a chance to learn a trade and all that. My, my brother had graduated the same high school I did, and uh, his name was Charles, and he, uh, anyway, he worked with my father. so. My father asked for time off to come to the graduation, and they came, and they came as a surprise. I met some people in Cheyenne that I became friendly with. They notified them that a graduation date was such and such a day. And as a surprise to me, they took the train uh, from Boston South Station out to Cheyenne, and they surprised me out, of, out on the base. Did your mother come too? My mother and father oh, came Oh, that's great. That's and they great. saw the parade. You're still at Fort Warren, but I suspect you're about to move out of there. Yes, sir. They sent me to, uh, we got our orders that day as to where we're going to go, and we're all congratulating each other, made a lot of very good, strong friendships, and, but we all uh, went different directions. And I was sent to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And what did you do there? I was sent to the 70th QM Mobile Truck Battalion. And there they were four companies, 3505, 3506, 3507, 3508, 70th QM Truck Battalion with Battalion Headquarters, and that was the unit. <clears throat> and uh, it was stationed at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And in those days, there was segregation. The officers were white, and all the drivers and enlisted men were black. And uh, so this was about, this was September 1942. And, uh, we worked together and uh, educated ourselves about truck battalions and convoys and picking up uh, material and, and ordnance and stuff like that. And uh, the men learned all about their trucks and so did the officers because we were platoon officers and we had to know more about them. And my education at the officers candidate school kept me in good stead. And uh, so we worked together, and then on April 1943, we were sent overseas. Tell me a little bit more about, uh, you're a white officer and had black troops working for you? Is yes, that correct? Uh, most of the officers were southern officers. I was one of the few northern officers that was assigned to the outfit. The, now the army was segregated at yes. this time. Yes. What did that entail, segregation in the United States Army? Well, uh, give me an idea. I, I came across it firsthand um, because I was fairly athletic as a young man. I loved athletics, and uh, um, I was in pretty good condition. And they made me the physical ed instructor for the battalion, and I would conduct these exercises, set up exercises with the battalion, all the men. And uh, then in time, uh, I got to know a lot of the men quite well, and some of them uh, were pretty good boxers. And were they, excuse me, these black troops under your command, were they from the South, or were they from they're uh, North and South. anywhere from the United North States? North and South. Yeah. All, they're all over the country. And um, so I, they had boxing teams. So I formed a boxing team for our battalion in different weights. Uh, welterweight, bantamweight, lightweight, middleweight, that kind of stuff. And um, when I felt we were ready, uh, I notified the uh, post special services officer that we would like to 
uh, be included in, the, in their boxing. They have boxing matches every Wednesday night, and uh, we would like to be included. And they shot us down because they would not allow, this is Oklahoma, and they would not allow uh, fights between blacks and whites. And they had to disband the boxing group. How was that received by your men? They were very unhappy, very unhappy. And I had to mollify them because it was my idea, and then I had to disappoint them. But they got over it. They got over it, and that, that was it. That they knew. I mean, the interesting thing is uh, the northern blacks were different than the southern blacks uh, as far as being good soldiers. The southern blacks were better soldiers. Were better soldiers in, in what way? More willing. Uh, uh, without more willing to do things that you than, that they were told to do without complaining, and uh, it was it was apparent that they were different. The type of work that you were involved in, how do you learn to um, put together convoys? Um, I take it you were sometime some kind of a fraternal brother to the Red Ball Express that Exactly. Was, yeah. Yeah, they got the publicity because But you did the same work, right? Well, we did the same work, but we were more the grunts than But how did were. you learn to do what they did? Well through experience. We landed at North Africa. And uh, we wait, 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 wait. Uh you you went overseas in April of forty three? Yes. Uh um, North at, Africa was November I believe. Yeah, that started the 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 November the Campaign, the American campaign involvement started in November of 1942. We didn't get overseas <clears throat> until April of 43. Okay. And we landed at Oran, North Africa. I don't mean to be ahead of you, but you're, you're, to answer your question, <clears throat> the best way we could learn was with practical experience. So when we landed in Oran, <clears throat> we set up our base, uh, our, our uh, bivouac area outside of the port of Oran. Um, and, and the invasion had been four months previous? Yes. Okay. Um, so that after we set up a bivouac area, you must understand that our battalion commander was as new as I was. I mean, he was, as a matter of fact, he was a reserve officer. And a uh, reserve officer was not as, in my opinion, as well trained as a man from Officers Kennedy School because from officers, before he got to officers candidates to school, he was an enlisted man. So he knew more of the Army field than the reserve officer who came in from civilian life and became, he was an officer right away. So we had the advantage as an OCS, as an OCS guy. But uh, once we got set up, uh, we just learned, by not so much tri trial and error, but uh, we formed our convoys, and if we were given orders to take 15 or 20 trucks over to this depot to pick up ammunition and go to this depot, uh, we'd give them strip maps. And this was the interesting part because none of us had ever been in North Africa in our lives, and, and we're told to go down this road and uh, find this depot and deposit your, your load. And uh, so we'd, these strip maps would say, Go down this road two and seven eighths mile, and uh, you'll see a sign that'll say, "Take a right uh, for such and such depot." And you take a right, then you see another sign uh, that might say, uh, uh, "Depot uh, a mile and three quarters over here," or something. And so we had to follow that. And it was difficult at night when it was blackout. I would imagine. Uh, I know it was a long time ago, but. Can you remember uh, what was the status of the invasion in uh, April of '43? Uh, had the, Cas the Battle of the Casserine been fought? Yes, yes. So, it was just about over when we landed yeah. in April of '43. It was just about over, and uh, we kept moving. Uh, we, and our next bivouac air was a, a little town called Mustaganum outside of uh, Algiers, and. Uh, this was, I say, as I say, sometime in April, and then we got to Bezert, uh, Tunis, 
uh, where they staged us getting ready for the invasion of Sicily, which is July of 1943. And what else uh, can you remember about your North African campaign? Um, well, I can't. Did you, did you see any really? action, as it were? No, no. Uh, we, uh, we, we were bringing supplies up. Uh, or we'd go forward and bring supplies back at different ports so these Liberty ships that are coming from the States would pick them up and take them out of there. Now, how are you staging for Sicily? What did that involve? Well, it involved tying our trucks down on some of these Liberty ships with the uh, chains, uh, I forget what you'd call it. What port were you in? Uh, I, I, th here again, I'm not sure whether we left from Tunis or Bazaar. I don't recall. And uh, we left, I, I would say it was D-Day plus five. I forget the exact day uh, after the invasion. And uh, we landed off, uh, we, we, had a, we had to tie our trucks down, as I say. That was a difficult period. We, we, we winched them down, I forget how a certain phraseology that don't come to mind at the moment, but we would tie them down pretty well and lock them in, all our trucks on this truck on this ship. And uh, when we landed... Um, Do you remember where you landed, Harold? It was Gala, G-E-L-A. The two landing points of Sicily was Gala and Lakata. We landed at Gala. And... Uh, the beach had been secured, and our job then was once we got off the ship, I guess it was one of these LSTs, the landing strip, where the landing ship where the front would come down, we drive our trucks off, and uh, these were powerful trucks. Uh, we'd get off in the mud or a little bit of water, and we just pull right out of there. Um, Can you tell us a minute uh, at this point, yeah, are you st still a second lieutenant? Yes, sir. Uh, how many people were you responsible for and how many trucks? How, what size of an outfit? You know, I'm trying to think whether they made me a first lieutenant before I went overseas. I think I was made a first lieutenant. I think I got promoted before we went. I think I was a first lieutenant when we got into So you got Africa. your silver bar. I think bar. I was a first okay. lieutenant at the time, yeah. And how, how many men were uh, you uh, have uh, under each, your command? Each company had about 200 men, and uh, each company had four platoons. Um, I had a platoon. We had uh, a captain who was the commanding officer, and we had three platoon officers. So three platoons with about 200 men. And um, I'd say I averaged around 15 to 20 trucks a convoy. And you roll off and you're in Sicily. What did you do there? Well, uh, here again, uh, I'd be notified that I'm taking a convoy out at uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon or 3 o'clock in the morning. It made no difference. I mean, it's 24 hours a day. And uh, I'm to take 15 trucks or 18 trucks or whatever the number of trucks they were. And uh, I, would assemble, I, I would have a platoon sergeant who would assemble all the drivers a few hours in advance and notify them we're going on a convoy at such and such a time. And they'd get their trucks ready to make sure that there's plenty of air in the tires, that the tanks are filled up, that the gas tanks are filled up, is properly oiled, uh, that is in proper shape before we left. And uh, we'd have our trucks ready uh, about well, a half hour before we're supposed to go, all lined up. And uh, whether it was one o'clock in the morning, one o'clock in the afternoon, as I say, it made no difference. This if, is, if it was blackout, it was a difference. This is D plus five. Yes. You arrived there. Uh, how far behind uh, the fighting lines were you? The lines were moving north up both coasts. Depending uh, on, on how fast the lines were moving. Uh, we would move our trucks up. Uh, we would go up to a convoy that might be about three or four miles behind the lines. 
uh, where the evacuation hospitals were. Uh, when, when the guys got wounded, they'd bring them back to the evacuation hospital. And then from the evacuation hospital, they sent them back to a more permanent hospital base. We'd go up to about that, that area, and then the uh, infantry battalions would send their own trucks back to pick up what we dropped off. But you got close enough to see the results of the battles. Um, never, no, we not, never uh, got that close. We're always, uh, as I say, when you're about three or four miles behind, that's, that's a long way uh, in a small island like Sicily. Uh, no, sometimes in Italy, for example, we're about maybe five or six miles behind. Where were you headed eventually? Were you going up uh, the east side or the west side? Well, I, I was trying to figure out that. We're going up. We're with you. You were with Patton? Yes. I take it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We, we were with, that's what they call the Third Army. Third Army and Patton was in charge. And uh, I would say we're on the west side, on the left side of the island. Mm -hmm. And because uh, Gaila and Licata are on the left side of the island. And uh, it took us only three months to secure Sicily. And so that we were in uh, Palermo by September. We had captured the uh, island of Sicily by September of 1943. Did you get any R and R? Did, did any pause before they uh, jumped I over? I don't think uh, I got any R and R in uh, Sicily. I don't think so. Uh, I never felt I needed it. I was young and I was strong and. Uh, we were busy, and uh, yeah, I mean, if we didn't take a convoy out, that, that was our R&R. &R. If, we, if, we, if uh, we had four companies, so that we always had a platoon uh, going out on convoys, you may have two or three or four of them going out. Can I ask you about um, the, the equipment you had? You said the trucks are great, but how about uh, the re were you clothed properly for being in Sicily? Yes, yes. It's interesting. We. Uh, when we went overseas, uh, all the officers were issued Thompson submachine guns, and the enlisted men were issued carbines. And so uh, on the ship uh, going overseas, it took us about 13 days from, we left Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, to Oran, uh, French Morocco. It took us about 13 days, and our job was constantly to take apart the Thompson submachine gun and keep it cleaned and oiled because of the salt air. And the uh, enlisted men had to do the same thing with their carbines. When we got to North Africa, they took away our Thompson submachine guns from the officers and they gave us pistols. But the uh, enlisted men still had carbines. So you were packing a 45? Yes. It was a 45 pistol, but not a revolver. So you look like George Patton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had occasion to use it once in Italy, but. Uh, we can get to that later. I, uh, but uh, Patton did come by our battalion one time, and uh, rumors started to come around about him. We we never really knew much about him except what we would hear. What did you hear? And we heard about that slapping incident in, in Sicily, where he slapped the soldier. Uh, but one of the things he did <coughs> insist upon was that. Uh, no matter where we were, we were to carry our sidearms all the time. The enlisted men would carry their carbines all the time, and not to put them down, and uh, just keep them all the time, and uh, to keep ourselves neat. And uh, that's about it. I mean, I uh, wasn't until I got to Italy when I heard more about him from those uh, who were closer to him than we were. I think it's possible. Um, that at some later date people might not be familiar with the slapping incident. Would you just review that for a well, second? Well, as I understand it, towards the end of the campaign, he was visiting an evacuation hospital, which is the first hospital from the front, where they're taken care of right away uh, and then sent back deeper into more permanent hospitals if the wounds are more were terrible or bad or, or else they were patched up and sent up. And uh, this particular evacuation hospital he came to uh, 
there was a, a GI who, in, I guess World War I would be somewhat, they say he was shell-shocked. Uh, I could understand it, uh, even though I wasn't uh, in that heavy battle stuff, because the, ap the, the, uh, the apprehension and the anxiety and not knowing who's around the corner and the bombs and all that bursting, and this constant pressure. Uh, this young man just folded, and uh, they sent him back out of his outfit to the evacuation hospital to uh, see if a psychiatry or psychologist could help him uh, come out of it. He was he was quiet. He said very little or nothing. He just uh, was beat. And uh, as I understand it. Uh, uh, Patton making his rounds at the hospital, uh, congratulating different people and, and encouraging them. I came across this young man and he accused him of cowardice and slapped him and get back up there and all that. And the, and the doctors and the nurses, they were furious. They'd have jumped him if, if they didn't realize that it would have cost them. But they, they hated that man for doing what he did to that soldier. I think uh, when Patton got older, or not when got older, but as the war came to a close, I, I think uh, whether I think his memoirs uh, or something uh, reflected some kind of a of a regret. I won't say an apology, but a regret. Well, he was officially reprimanded by yes. the president, well Eisenhower, uh, for that. Can you tell us what Sicily looked like in the part you were? Yes, it was mountains. Describe it and. The effect it had on your trying to maintain a fleet of trucks. It was a mountainous island, and uh, it uh, it looks like it has a lot of great beaches and all. But I never saw them. Once we landed in Gala, Gala was was a beach. But once we got away from there and went farther north and more inland, it was mountainous and uh, very hilly. And when we had to take convoys at night, for example. Uh, the uh, Luftwaffe was still in, in, in operation at that time. And uh, so I had to be careful of, uh, of air attacks. And uh, as a matter of fact, <laughs> there was a humorous incident. We landed at North Africa. Um, they gave us new trucks. Instead of the trucks being a metal cab, uh, they gave us trucks with a metal ring and a canvas roof over the driver. Uh, there's a metal ring, a ring and the, you, you mounted a 50 caliber machine gun. And uh, then it had a canvas roof which you could roll back so that uh, every fifth truck was to have a 50 caliber machine gun. So that if we're on convoy and the German planes came down to strafe us, we could fight back. So as platoon officers, we were told to uh, train our drivers how to fire this machine gun. So I found a beach uh, outside of Mastaganum uh, where I could, I brought my crew, my 20 trucks and drivers uh, over to this beach. And I figured that we could fire out to the Mediterranean out there in the water so they could learn how to use the machine gun. And uh, we fed the machine gun the 50 caliber bullets and and every fifth bullet was a tracer, and we could see that thing. So that the men would have a feel for the machine guns. And uh, shortly thereafter, there's a cloud of dust in the distance, it got bigger and bigger, and this reconnaissance vehicle came up. And there was a general, and a lieutenant, and a captain, and two other men. And they jumped out, and they said, who's in charge? And all they listened to was pointing to me. And you looked Him. around. <laughs> Him. <laughs> I said, I walked over and I saluted. I said, Yes, sir, I, I'm the officer in charge. Do you realize you're firing out? I said, Yes, sir. I'm firing out to the Mediterranean. I'm training these men how to fire the gun. Well, I didn't know this, but there was a spit of land that came, curled around, and um, uh, I, it was beyond the horizon. We couldn't see it around the, where the horizon was. And that spit of land. There are some men, uh, army troops, and I guess there some of the bullets are getting near them, and they came over and they 
raised hell with me, and they said, there's some men there. Well, I didn't know. And I apologized, and I said, I just shut it down. I said, the hell with it. You know, they, 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 they got a feel for it. And they, but, Another fine but mess. But it's interesting. <laughs> All, simultaneous to every moment. Him. <laughs> but anyway, to go back to Sicily, uh, as I say, the, it was mountainous, and uh, when we ran our convoys, especially at night, we had to run them at blackout. And we had these machine guns mounted on the, uh, on the trucks. When you're at blackout, uh, you can't see very much in front of you unless there's a full moon. And if there was no full moon, you had to be very careful. Uh, and and le uh, see, I would lead the convoy, and uh, we had to be very careful as we proceeded because it was dark as to where we're going. Uh, in one particular place we came to, uh, they hadn't yet cleared it of mines, and my truck driver was nervous about the lead, lead truck about going in there. So I had to lead, I, I, had, I went in there with my Jeep driver first, and then the, the two minesweepers were in front of me with the Geiger counters. Were you ever uh, yourself bombed or strafed? No, but there was a situation uh, where we crossed a bridge. This was uh, in Italy. Uh, we crossed a bridge and found our area to drop our load. We came back, that bridge was gone, it was blown up. And uh, we had no way of getting over, except that uh, I went down the bank and uh, there was a stream and it wasn't too deep. I went back up and we tried, one truck went down, crossed the stream, went back up the bank and then we followed, uh, all the trucks went back up again. Those trucks were, were great trucks. Evidently. You told us you wound up in uh, Palermo in September. Yes. Uh, this is 40... 43. 43. Um, obviously, you were going to invade Italy. Yes. Um, a lot of German troops escaped off of Sicily, made it across back o across yes. the Straits. Um, how did you get over to Italy yourself? We, uh, we crossed the Straits of Messina uh, on boats. Again, we had to lash our uh, trucks onto these boats, crossed the Straits of Messina, and went up through Reggio Calabria. Uh, I'm not sure. I'd say that was like D plus four, D plus five. Mm -hmm. And uh, but that was a Reggio Calabria was a very hilly, rocky, mountainous area, and it was very difficult. But we did get our trucks. As a matter of fact, group headquarters. Uh, Fifth Army uh, had given us about 20 ambulances to take along, in addition to our trunks, because uh, they needed them. So we, we, we included the ambulances with our trunks. That became part we of your convoy over, yes. work, yeah. Okay, tell us what you did in uh, Italy. Was it more of the same, that you're oh, yes. taking supplies? Uh, did you carry troops as well? Oh, yes. We carried. We carried, after we uh, got north and Salerno was, uh, was taken and Naples was taken, uh, the ships would come in to Naples from the United States and we'd send our convoys down on Naples and pick up off the Liberty ships and go forward uh, up towards uh, wherever the front was. And it we would take troops, uh, ammunition, fuel, food, anything. The, whatever they wanted. The, but it seems to me the the battle became more compressed there, that uh, you were closer to uh, attack, uh, closer to Germans uh, hitting you from the air or, or on land. Mm -hmm. Did you see more combat or? No. no? Uh, by that time, the Luftwaffe was just about gone. Whatever the planes the Luftwaffe had, were, I guess were concentrating over in uh, France or Germany or that area. Uh, the, we had uh, dominance uh, of the skies. Uh, there was one uh, particular incident that was scary when uh, they, uh, there was a German bomber that went over and our anti-aircraft was trying to bring it down. They had the, it was at night and the searchlights uh, had them. They had about six searchlights and they, no way this bomber could escape and they sent up the anti-aircraft right near us. And the hot lead had come down, and fortunately wearing our helmets, but 
I don't know if that would have been enough because this hot lead was coming down would have gone right through the helmet and it was banging all around us. All we could do was just find a place to hide and get away from the possibility of getting hit by something. You're talking arrows. about the shrapnel from expended shells is yes. coming down on you. Yes. So even did they get the bomber? Yes. Uh, well, I, I say they got the bomber. They had them in their sights, and they uh, all I could see that as they kept going away, uh, I didn't see them shoot them down, but they had them. Whether they, I'm sure they got them. Were you close to other incidents uh, where your life was in peril? Not really. Except driving around in the dark where there are mines. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get used to that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, as I say, I was always somewhat of an adventurous kid, and uh, that's the way it was. I rolled with it, accepted it, and there was much I could do. Did you do the same thing till, until the end of the war? All the way through, yes. Uh, the war uh, ended, uh, I guess it was May of 1945. And uh, then uh, everybody was being sent home. That's in Europe, the war in Europe. Yeah, and, well, yeah, the war in Europe along yeah. with Italy. And then they're getting ready to go home. Uh, so uh, to keep us busy until we went home, uh, they organized baseball teams in Italy, and I, uh, uh, I organized a baseball team. But by this time, Truman was president, and we were allowed <coughs> allowed to play white teams. Now, and Truman, let's hold it a second here. Uh, Truman became president in April of forty-five. Four, Forty-four. Forty-four. I think. Uh, oh no, forty-five. Yes, yeah. I think Roosevelt died in April of forty-five. Sorry. And he desegregated the armed forces. Yes, he did. I, I'm not sure to what extent, but I do know that uh, starting, I think, sometime in, <coughs> excuse me, um, probably June or July. Now, the war is over. Yes. And you're in Europe. Uh, tell us about where you were when it ended. We're almost near the Switzerland border. We're uh, at a t town called Verona, V-E-R-O-N-A. Uh, I, I had a Romeo and Juliet's hometown. I guess so. I uh, had a couple of rest leaves I was sent to Lido de Venice, which is a little island off the coast of Venice. Another time I was sent to Florence. <coughs> Another time I was sent have to a, Lake have Como. Have a drink. Thank you. Another time I was sent to Lake Como. So you were in northwestern Europe yeah, on the which, Swiss which border. Which wasn't too far from the Swiss Switzerland's Alps. on the other side of the yeah, lake. Right. Yeah. And uh, there was a, uh, an, a, a problem. Uh, one of the platoon officers was driving through one of the towns in that area, and the war was almost over. And there's a battle between the partisans and a lot of fascist sympathizers in that town. And they're firing at, you, at each other. The convoy was going through between them, and one of the bullets hit the steering wheel of the jeep where the officer was, and caromed off there and went right through his neck. <coughs> Didn't kill him, but uh, through a portion of his neck, and they got him to the hospital, and he was saved. But that was a, an incident that he went, was going through. Harold, uh, my notes tell me, and that you were kind enough to share before, uh, that you had some pretty uh, historical experiences after this uh, that you were told one day to report for you were from Naples oh, yeah, down I, to Rome. Can you tell us about that? I, um, well, I was made company commander sometime in August of a, my company was 3507th QM Truck Company and they were sending men home and the commanding officer of 3506th was sent home, so they asked me to take over 3506th QM Truck Company and become their company commander. And I was. And uh, I got a, an order from group headquarters to take three trucks and myself and a jeep and some armed guards. We were, uh, at that time, bivouacked 
outside of Naples near a town called Aversa, which had a military prison. And I was told to go up to Rome and uh, pick up a German, three German generals and about seven enlisted German men. One of the three German generals was to be executed. His name was General Dostler, D-O-S-T-L-E-R. Um, he had a, he was responsible for the murder of a number of American GIs who were dropped behind the lines and uh, they were to sabotage um, some rail lines or something uh, behind the German lines and they were captured but they were in full uniform and they should have been prisoners of war and Dossler executed all of them. Um, this was like, like a precursor of the Nuremberg trials where Dossler's defense was he got orders from Hitler and being a good Prussian German soldier he followed orders and Hitler said execute them and he executed them. However, the uh, war crimes tribunal or the war crimes uh, committee. The Nuremberg trial? Well, it's a precursor to the Nuremberg trial. Okay. Um, they felt that uh, he should have disobeyed Hitler's order. That they, they held him responsible for the execution of these American soldiers. <clears throat> so when I went up to Rome, I had three trucks and myself and a Jeep driver. They were all armed. This was about the distance from Naples to Rome. It was like almost Boston to New York and back the same day. <clears throat> and uh, so when I got up there, I had my men yeah, have lunch while I made the arrangements. And uh, I picked up General Dossler from one prison, two more German generals from another prison, and about seven enlisted men from another prison. And I put them, I put the German generals in one truck, the enlisted men in another truck, and the third truck was empty or a spare. And I then went south from Rome back to Naples. And the spare truck would go, would be at the rear. And uh, I led the group back to Naples. Halfway there, there was honking and I pulled over and they wanted a rest period they, they, to relieve themselves. And I said, okay, let them off the trucks and formed a perimeter. I had about nine guards besides myself. And uh, we were all armed and we formed a perimeter and allowed them to handle themselves. In the process, General Dossler uh, asked if he could have, he had a, a bag of personal stuff that I had on my Jeep. And he said, there's a letter there from his daughter. Could he, he hadn't had a chance to read it. Could he, while we were there, read it? And uh, I made arrangements for him to have it. And he read it. I remember, remember it very well. His eyes missed it, uh, like he was crying. And then he handed it back, and then he stood straight, saluted me, and I saluted him back. And uh, then put them all back on the trucks, and we headed back. It was interesting, when I signed for them in Rome, the receipts were <laughs> uh, that I signed for a live German general, signed for two live German generals, signed for live, in other words, they gave them to me live. I better bring them back to Aversa live. And uh, when I brought them back to Aversa and, dr and brought them back to the prison, I made sure they signed for live German generals. And Can I interrupt a second to uh, give some historical background to what you're telling here? The New York Times talked about the case in which this general was convicted of killing the Americans. It says it evoked tremendous discussion in the Mediterranean theater. The fact remains that many senior officers in the regular United States Army have been most uncomfortable about the verdict, and not a few have said so. This was the thesis of um, committing illegal crimes 
upon direct orders. This order came directly from Hitler down to this general. He carried them out and was convicted and was sentenced to death. Is that correct? Yes. And you were part of a very historic thing. Um, you delivered him live, I take it? Yes. I, uh, I, I happened to, uh, uh, shortly thereafter, I was sent home. Sent home sometime in the latter part of October, first part of November. I was in New York City in December when I read that story in the New York Times. And as I read the story uh, of the execution of General Dossler, it had, they had pictures of him tied to a pole, and he had a black mask over his head, and he was shot. Um, he was executed. He was executed. Uh, the possibility was that if I hadn't been sent home, I might have been one of those officers that either uh, called for the order to fire uh, or whatever. And so, I mean, uh, it's one of these things where I can't argue with what was in the New York Times. That I understand that the officer who uh, had applied the coup de grace uh, was quite anguished over it, but uh, c'est la vie, I mean, that's life. This was the, the whole thesis of the Nuremberg trials, was it exactly, not? To exactly. To determine whether or not a direct order should be carried out uh, if it's an illegal act, and Nuremberg, the trial decided no, right. that there are higher laws than the military law. Well, higher, well especially a, from a crazy dictator like like uh, Hitler, I mean this, this guy, uh, he was about three bricks short of a load. So I mean you couldn't go by what by his orders. And yet by the same token, I can still see this General Dossler. Uh, he was paunchy, and, but he was erect. He was a typical Prussian career soldier. Uh, he was the kind of a guy who, even before Hitler came to power, who made up his mind that. The German army was, was to be his career, and uh, he was uh, very uh, prim as an officer. I noticed the picture of him in the Times, standing there waiting for the bullets to strike him. His boots are highly polished. Yeah, he, was, uh, he was a real professional German soldier. and. Uh, I don't forget exactly when this happened, when he had them executed, but if he didn't have them executed, would he have been executed by Hitler? No, I don't know. I, I don't recall exactly what happened. That's, that's the threat I read about. Yeah. You came home and were discharged in uh, January of 46. Yes. And uh, I think you went back to Boston University and got your degree at in June least. of '47. So yes. you worked six years to get that degree, and yeah, you I got did it. it. I, I was very proud of the fact that I did it in the six academic years. I, <clears throat> that uh, I did four and a half years before the service. I came home and took the second semester of my fifth year in January of '46, and got married to my wife Miriam. Is there a in June of '46? Most memorable experience of your rather impressive career in the United States Army? No, not a most memorable. There, there, there were a lot of a lot of a lot of um, interesting experiences. I know it sounds silly that if I use the word, I enjoyed my four years in the army. Uh, I remember I uh, after I got out. I went back in the reserves, and uh, I stayed in the reserves till 1957. They made me a captain. So I didn't get out, I was a captain. But I, uh, I liked the Army. I liked the outdoors. I liked following orders. I liked accomplishing things. Uh, one of the things that I enjoyed <clears throat> when the war was over and they keep us busy, as I started to say, around, sometime around June, they sent over uniforms and gloves and bats and balls, and they formed baseball teams. And 
We just had a battalion, and we only had about 800 men, and we played divisions of 15,000 men, so that I got, a, I got up a baseball team, and uh, I was the only white player on the team. I played first base, and everybody else was blacks, so and we played some of these white teams. As I s said earlier, by the time Truman took over, there was desegregation was taking place, and my big thrill was we played a team of major leaguers, former major leaguers and minor leaguers. And uh, uh, they were razzing me because not, not only was I was white, the only white guy on the black team, but I was an officer so that the listen men had a great day. But Double I cost to razz you. I didn't <laughs> mind. I, uh, I enjoyed the game very much. And I enjoyed hitting a home run. This is the big thing in my life. The guy who pitched against us Pitch, uh, was, was a minor league that pitched for Minneapolis-St. Paul. This is the minor league team that Kyle Yastrzemski came from to play for the Red Sox. And Minneapolis-St. Paul had a good minor league team. They were like a double-A. And also in the team were some major leaguers. The third baseman was Heine Majeski, who played in Philadelphia Athletics. And Bert Haas, who played second base Cincinnati Reds. And playing left field was a pitcher for Chicago White Sox named Edgar Smith. So. This guy, uh, his pitcher, had two strikes on me, and uh, he figured that he had a cookie, and I knew that any pitcher around the plate I'm going to swing at. So he grew to the third one. He's going to strike me. He threw every, everything he had on, and uh, I caught it just right, center of the right field of his head for a home run. As I rounded the bases, Edgar Smith was running in from left field and running over to the pitcher, and he says, you want to make the majors, you'll never make the majors. Who do you think you are? You never saw this guy before in your life. You got two strikes on him. You're supposed to waste the third one. You try to strike him out and he caught you. Well, anyway, the reason for this is that a few years ago I was looking through the Almanac and the 1941 winning pitcher for the All Star game in 1941 was Edgar Smith, who was playing <laughs> left field. So that was a big That's how close it was. He recovered from your blow. <laughs> that was a big throw. You, uh, you, you became a captain in the reserves. You, I, I have noted you've got five battle stars in the Presidential Union uh, Unit United. Citation, yes. Good Conduct Medal. Uh, did you ever join any uh, veterans groups after you came home? Yes. Uh, I, I, when I came home, I helped form a VFW post in Dorchester. And uh, we started a new called Dorchester Memorial VFW Post. Then, uh, when I got married and I moved away from the area, I uh, was not active in the VFW until I moved here. Uh, I, I moved to Natick in 1952. We were married, and uh, we had two children. And uh, then things got better for me financially. I moved to Newton. Then we moved back here uh, in 1977 to Framingham, to where I live now. And uh, I joined the VFW and the Jewish War Vets. Mm -hmm. How important to you was serving in the military? Very important. Very important. I felt like, of course, a very, very tiny, tiny cog, but I felt, <clears throat> I felt like I was making a contribution to the country. Uh, as I say, when I enlisted, the patriotism was so universal was so contagious. Uh, the flag is so beautiful. Uh, my wife uh, has mentioned that. The, uh, she's, my wife Mary, when she looks at flags around the world, like at the, uh, when you watch the, uh, the Olympics, the most beautiful flag is the American flag. Of course, the Italians may think differently, the Germans may think differently, the, the Australians may think differently, but it's a beautiful flag. And, uh, it was a great opportunity for every, as a matter of fact, all, uh, my three brothers were in the service with me at different times. My older brother, who was married, was drafted, and he went in. My younger brother, one of my younger brothers, my bro older brother Eddie, one of my younger brother Childs, who was working in defense with my father and who would have been deferred for the whole war, uh, quit and enlisted. And uh, he became, he was a machine gunner and he was wounded in Germany. And then the youngest brother, Sumner, uh, didn't turn 18 until 1946, I think. 
and he enlisted, and they sent him to Japan. So he was in the Army of Occupation in Japan. So all four of us were in. And uh, so your mother had four blue stars in the window. And uh, we often hear about the telegram coming to my mother about my brother being injured, being wounded. And uh, all she had to read was, we would get to inform you, and she called her sister, who came right over and read the rest of it, that uh, he, he was a, uh, he was in a machine gun unit uh, that had ta retaken the town in Germany. And uh, they, had, they were clustered around and just about setting up when a mortar shell landed among the whole group and killing about two or three of them. And he got a lot of shrapnel on his back. And uh, the Germans retook the town. He crawled into a cellar, and he could hear them walking around overhead out in the street and, uh, until the Americans retook the town when he came out. Is there any one thought or incident as we end this tape that you would like to talk to us about, something I haven't asked you, something that would be of interest to people uh, 40, 50 years from today? <clears throat> this is a great country. It's a beautiful country. You have to go around the world. You have to go to other countries to appreciate this country. It's unfortunate, but if you go to France or Germany or, or Spain or Australia or Africa, Asia, this is the greatest country in the world. And I wish people would stop complaining about the taxes. We pay less taxes than all the major powers in the world. We pay less taxes than Great Britain or France or Germany or Spain or Italy or Australia. So what? I mean, it's a small price to pay for the freedom we have here and the great democracy you have. There's no other democracy in the country that compares with how beautifully our democracy is run. There are some countries that may call themselves democracy. They can call themselves whatever they want, but they may not be democracies. This is a pure, true democracy. And they should be very, very proud of this. I, I felt badly during the Vietnam War at the lack of support by a great many Americans. Um, maybe because I was in World War II. But the Korean War was a tough war. Uh, it didn't have the glamour of World War II. I feel for these Korean veterans. They were great. They went through a great deal. And so did the Vietnamese, uh, so did the Vietnam veterans. And people who criticized them at the time owe them an apology. They owe everyone who served in the Vietnam War an apology for not having, for finding fault with them. What are they finding fault with? They were good Americans. They were drafted or they enlisted. They did as they were told, and they went in. Those who enlisted were patriotic and went in. Those who were drafted went in and did the best they could. And for people to find fault with them is shameful and disgraceful, and I hope it never happens again. Harold, we thank you very much for coming in today. My pleasure. You're very articulate, and we appreciate it. Oh, I have to look up the word articulate.